Hallelujah. Praise you, Lord. Yes. He is Lord over every Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. And Jesus. our knees to Him bow. Amen. Hallelujah. We do not bow to an earthly king. We do not bow to an earthly government. Right. We bow to our king. Hallelujah. We bow to our Lord. Hallelujah, Jesus. And the reason we serve earthly kings and earthly governments is through our Lord Jesus Christ. Right. Amen? Amen. 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 It is exciting to be here today on Troop Sunday. I think Amen. some people um, didn't quite get the memo. This is, this is a Sunday for everybody, yeah. but today we want to recognize that, that we are gathered together and we want to pray over our troops today. But before we get to all those other things, we want to get to the Word of the Lord today. So, you may take your seats and we're going to continue with just sharing what God would have us do in this world. Now, this is not, not really in the terms of, of the series that we've been doing, but the title of the message today is Unless the Lord Builds. Unless... The Lord builds. Now I know that we can finish that sentence from Psalm 127. Unless the Lord builds, unless the Lord builds the house, he who labors, labors in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, now today is Troop Sunday, but the focus that we want to have is, is we want to look at what the psalm is telling us and understand that that is the direct purpose for ministry in the church. That is the direct purpose for ministry through the troops, through Trail Life USA, through American Heritage Girls. The direct purpose is that we are intent on establishing a house built by the Lord. Yes. Amen? Yeah. A house built by the Lord. Let's read Psalm 127. It's not many verses, but let's read it so that we get the full context of what that says. Psalm 127, it begins and says, A song for pilgrims ascending to Jerusalem. A psalm of Solomon. Now, the songs of ascension are interesting psalms. There's quite a few of them, and you can go look them up, um, and you'll find them there. But, but a psalm of ascension is a psalm that was dedicated for a specific time and a specific purpose. God had declared in Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16, it says, Three times a year all your men are to appear, to appear before the Lord your God in the place He will choose, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and the Feast of Tabernacles. No one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. The instruction is given over and over through the Old Testament that the men of Israel were to go up to Jerusalem three times a year and there go before the Lord. And this psalm is one of the psalms they would recite, they would sing, and they would speak over themselves and their families three times a year as they went up. Verse 1, Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. This is the New Living Translation. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. It is useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat. For God gives rest to His loved ones. Children are a gift from the Lord. And they are a, re a reward from Him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a, warri in a warrior's hand. Verse 5, How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. 
He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers in the city gates. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Family, church of God, this is not talking about the temple. This is not talking about the tabernacle. This is not talking about a place of worship. Now, we may use it for that, and we may speak of it and think of it in those terms, but if we go and we dig down to the psalm, this psalm is saying the house, the family, unless God builds the family, the workers, the parents, the grandparents, the uncles and the aunts, will labor in vain. Unless God is central to your home and to your family, you are working on a task that you cannot finish. You are busy with something that you can never bring to God's intended end. You can never take it to where God expects it to go unless God builds the house. All your toil, all your plans, everything that you can do will wind up to nothing at all. And today there are so many pressures on how we build our families. There are so many ways, there's so many voices Right? Have you heard them as a parent? In this ear, that ear. You turn your eyes there, you just hear it, and you hear the, the statements and the judgments and the condemnations of how you should raise your family, how you should give them this, how you should give them that. But the Word of the Lord is clear to us today as it was back when this psalm was written by Solomon, that unless the Lord builds the house, Unless the Lord is building your family, you're wasting your time. Now, in talking about why we, going to, why we understand, why we believe that God has called us as a church into troop ministry, I want to share just a few things that I did on Tuesday night when I spoke to, to the, the teams that were gathered. And... I don't believe that we could hear this too much. See, the atheist academia, so to speak, have a way of rewriting the dictionary. Have you noticed? Making up new words and changing the definitions of old ones. And under the name of progress in our society, they actually want to take us back to a time before Christ. And if you do some history and you go back to before Christ, and you study world history at that time, it was not a pleasant time to be alive. But where in those times infanticide was common, slavery was the law, and discrimination was rife. For a hundred years or more, progressives have worked at conquering the mountain of education. Among others, of course, but we're just focusing on this one. And they have effectively turned seminaries into cemeteries. Harvard is an example of that. Theological training into atheist indoctrination camps. You see, those who hold the mountain of education shape generations to come. They shape business owners, they shape politicians, teachers and lawyers. And what they designed to do back then was to change the world view of everyone. And in fact, they have pretty much succeeded. 
The last holdout is the church. The last holdout is those who believe in Christ. Those who call Him King. Those who know Him as Lord. The ecclesia is holding back the storm. The ecclesia can and shall continue to hold back the storm. I believe that we are coming into a day when we are standing up and saying no more. Trail Life USA, just by the way, is only eight years old this month. And it is being flooded and growing in leaps and bounds because there's a cry among God's people saying, we want more. And we are tired of the diet we have been receiving. Yes. You see, our children are indoctrinated by false worldview prophets every day in our nation's classrooms. Parents are no longer the greatest influence in a child's life. Critical race theory, it's a new theory, word, and there's all kinds of phrases that people are knocking about, and you can know when they've, been, when they've started being indoctrinated by it. But it is nothing less than intellectual racism. Health classes produced by Planned Parenthood, of all things, are being taught to our kids in our schools, and they're filled with graphic and explicit material. You see, churches have only got your children, our children, for one Sunday a week. That's if they attend every week, 52 hours a year. Now, thank God we don't year limited to one hour. We're more about, let's get the word in. So if school has our children for 180 days for six hours a day on average, that is 1,080 hours that the children are at school. And we're not counting the influence through extracurricular activities, through television, through social media, and the like. We're not counting that. We're just saying this is school. See, there's four questions that we have to answer in understanding our world. And the questions are, question of origin. What is that? Where did I come from? That's an important question. Where did I come from? And it matters who you're asking. The question of destiny. Where am I going to? The question of purpose. Why am I here? And the question of morality. How shall I live? We have to answer these questions. I read an illustration this week, and it makes perfect sense. If I took a painting and held it up here, a Rembrandt, that wouldn't be nice if I could hold a Rembrandt in my hand, but if I held it up here and I said, um, how do you know there was a painter? How do you know Rembrandt was alive? How? You would know because the painting is proof of the painter. Mm -hmm. Right? When I look at a building, how do I know there was a builder? The building is proof of the builder. The same logic flows at creation. Creation is proof of the creator. Genesis 1.26 tells us, Then God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. In verse 27, God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female, he created them. You and I come from a creator. We were created in his image. Now to the, to the, the bulk of us here sitting, there's no question about that. Anybody have a question about that? You know that you were created by God in His image. But every child sitting in here that goes to, to a school where they're not taught from a biblical basis 
are taught exactly the opposite. It's in their textbooks, it's in their studies, and it's in more than their sign symbology. It shows up in their history, it shows up everywhere. And the, prow the powerful message of where did I come from is attacked every day. It's not just in school, it's attacked in media, it's attacked everywhere. You see, the process of evolution is scientifically impossible. There is no scientific possibility for nothing to create everything. In fact, that's intellectual suicide. Have we entertained the idea of evolution? Millions of years and ape-like creatures. And after all, that is the primarily taught in schools and in education everywhere. And it's taught as a fact. And any dissension, any questioning of that can result in serious trouble. If I ask the kids in the room, I said, if you sitting in a classroom and your teacher says, well, evolution shows us this, what would happen if you stood up and you raised your hand and said, I don't believe in evolution because God created everything? What do you think would happen in that classroom? Do you think that it would go down well? Do you think that the teacher would say, oh, no, you have a good point? It's important that we, we not only understand these things, and they not just become church things. They're not just something we agree to on a Sunday morning, but it's something that is agreed to in our whole heart. It's agreed to in, in our value system, in how we live, so that when somebody tries to tell us that we were made by, we came from nothing, and therefore now we are, we can stand up and say, no, no, that cannot be. That, that there's no factual system to that. There is no rhyme or reason to believe that nothing made everything. But we are not equipped to stand up and make those statements. And the intimidation of the classroom keeps us quiet. You see, any dissension to the system of, of evolution is written off as intellectually inferior or even narrow-minded. You see, none of what evolution teaches even suggests can be observed. And all of it is hypothetical facts. And they're based on assumptions. You need more faith to believe that everything came from nothing than to believe that God created everything. But if we all descended from apes, if we could possibly entertain that just for a moment, over millions of years, of random accidents that eventually produce life, then somehow life developed into more complicated life forms and more complicated life forms, and over the process of time, you suddenly find, well, they're humans. If this is our past, then we have no future. Our future doesn't matter. If we are an accident created by accidents out of random mistakes, then we have no future. We don't matter. But if we are the result of God, if we are a result of 
a Creator God who made us with intent and purpose, then we have, then our lives matter. We have purpose, we have a future, we have a reason to be alive. See, we're not the byproduct of accidents. But if we were, there would be no absolute truth. No absolute morality. No true meaning to life. No value, no purpose. And ultimately, no absolute rules to follow. All we would have is societal consensus. All we would have that. And what society wants to do is strip away the Ten Commandments. Why? Because the Ten Commandments say, this is what God says. This is God's law. This is God's way. There is a standard and God has made it clear. And as society strips that away, they fall into a deeper, deeper sense of being lost. You see, our value is more than just so much more than just a slug or a dolphin. Because both are, by terms of the scientific community, products of evolution. But we were created in the image of God. The image of a triune God, who is just, is holy and loving. He's relational. And it makes sense that we are the pinnacle of His creation. You see, because if that is true, and that is true, then we can answer some serious questions. You see, you and I were created in the image of God. That's where we came from. We came from God. You came from God. Therefore, you and I are, where are we going? We're going to heaven. We're going back to God. We have a place with God. Or, we're going to hell. A place without God. Depending on the choice that we make of whom we will serve. See, our purpose is found in the one who created us. And that's our value. Our value is not in what we do. Some people find their value only in what they do. What do you do for a living? Where do you live? What do you drive? Go down the list. If your value is in things or achievements, those are material things. Those are things that go by and will not last. But if your value is linked directly to God, your value is of great, great purpose, great value, so much so that Jesus died for you. God assessed the value of a human life. So much so that He gave His Son. That's the value of a human life. But the world doesn't value even infants in the womb. It doesn't value the life of individuals. You see, knowing that where we came from, knowing who our God is, knowing our value, also tells us, gives us our morality. Because it tells us how we shall live. If God has placed this much value in us, then it tells us how we should live, and we should live holy as He is holy. God sets the standard of truth. It's not arbitrary. It's not for the intellectuals to come to some kind of consensus somewhere and say, well, this is now the truth. Or as the common thing goes around, well, your truth and my truth, there's no such thing. God sets the standard of truth. God sets a standard of morality. And it's not up for debate. God sets the standard for meaning, for value, and for purpose. 
you are so much more valuable than what you can contribute to society. Your value goes beyond your contribution to the world and to society. Your contribution to the world and society comes because you are valuable. Comes out of the purpose that God made you. You are intrinsically valuable to an all-powerful, all-knowing, omniscient God who created you for good works in Jesus Christ. So why troop life? See, we know that we need to disciple a generation. We know that we need to disciple a generation to withstand the pressures and the onslaughts of the enemy. We have to raise a generation that will object to false statements made in the classroom, made on the playground, made even in pulpits. We need to raise a generation that will stand up and say, this is the truth. And be able to not just challenge it and then fall flat, but able to challenge it and follow through with truth. We have to raise a generation that can stand the pressures of our day and succeed. You see, in troop life, we want to celebrate what it means to be a boy and a girl. It means to be a boy, what it means to be a girl. There's no confusion. God created male and female. There is no confusion about this. Not in God's Word, and there should be none among the believers, and the believers of God should not tolerate the nonsense. Especially when it's set in a classroom, it's set in a boardroom, where it's set as some kind of inclusion training. We need to raise a generation that can stand up and say, no, it is not so. You see, the exception never replaces the rule. We have to point our young lives to a worldview, to a solid worldview, but to do that, you know, it's not just sit them in a classroom and train them with intellectual boredom. But we, the troops bring excitement. They bring fun. And they fill it with the Word of God. They fill the fun and the adventure with truth. They fill those moments with powerful tools that will help children stand up against the fray of the enemy. But all of this, all that we do, all of troop life will mean nothing if we don't point them to Christ. It's not just about changing a worldview, but that worldview matters little or nothing. It will never be grasped unless they are pointed to Christ. Because that's where it stands. That's where it pivots. That's where it holds strong. Yes, in troop life, the kids will get badges and they'll get awards and all kinds of wonderful things. But it's not about that. If we don't point them to Christ, everything they gained will not be worth anything at all. Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders, the work of the builders is wasted. Unless the Lord protects a city, guarding it with sentries will do no good. You can stand up and you could try to protect your children. You could try to lock them in. You could say, well, no social media, no TV, no this, no that. You can try. But unless the Lord protects the house, you can guard your house with sentries. You can post an army outside. But unless the Lord builds the house, all your protections are in vain. I have seen so many times where parents have raised children and they've raised them in a bubble. But because the Lord didn't build the house, the children became a statistic. 
You can, you can say, I'm going to raise them with Christian values, but that's not, raised, that's not letting the Lord build the house. It's allowing the presence of God to be in that situation. Now, trail life, three words that summarize it, adventure, character, and leadership. Based in Colossians chapter 1, verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. That's incredible. That will preach all by itself. American Heritage goes faith, service, and fun. Psalm 78, verse 4. We will not hide these truths from our children. We will tell the next generation about the glorious deeds of the Lord, about His power and His mighty wonders. This is what it's about. We're not going to hide from the Lord. This week I witnessed something incredible. It's just, as I've been thinking about it, when the week started, I got a call, an urgent call saying, our brother is in trouble. Will you pray? And we sent out a text to, to everyone in the church and said, please pray for our brother. And you did. And God did an amazing thing. But not only did we pray, but my wife, Pastor Jerry Lynn, prophesied into that situation life. She spoke life. She spoke the word of the Lord into that situation. And our brother is doing amazingly well, and he's soon to be home. It's incredible what God will do when we're obedient to Him. What God will do when we follow His prompts, when we stamp up and, and say, yes, we will pray, we will push through, we will do something for God. And then when God does this, then we tell the next generation. We teach our children. We say that God is a God who heals. God is a God who delivers. We sang about strongholds being broken. It's time that we tell our children that God breaks strongholds. That every addiction, every idea of depression, every, everything that is outside of God's Word, we can speak to it and say, the Word of the Lord for you is that you shall be healed. You shall raise up from that bed of sickness. You will stand in the place. You will worship the Lord. And to the children it is that you will stand and you will be a generation that will not cave to the pressures. You will be a leader in the next generation. See, there's children, there's parents alive today who believe that, that they don't need to train their children in matters of faith. The statistics that I gave you of how much time kids spend at school versus how much time they spend in church needs to tell every parent, I have to be so invested in training my children in the things of God and I need to find every way that I can get them trained in the things of God. This is and should be my priority. See, you can make a mistake. You can put your children in Christian school and think that now because a Christian school has them for 1,080 hours, you don't have to do your job. You're mistaken. You're mistaken. A parent's job is much greater than just putting them in the right place. It's important that we understand how, how incredibly valuable the raising of children up in the right way. You see how world is filled with ABC attitudes. Anything but Christ. Anything but Christian. Muslims are, are in. Schools have prayer rooms. Yoga is in in schools. That's Hinduism. Meditation is in. That's Buddhism. Acupuncture is in. That's Shintoism. And we can go down the list. These things are in school. They talk about it. 
When have you ever gone to a doctor's room and found a pamphlet that said, oh, this is a book where that says that Jesus, by the stripes of Jesus, you are healed. Therefore, you can, you can pray that God will heal you of your sickness and your disease. Have you ever seen one in a doctor's room? I have not, but I've seen one where you can, where your, your, your medical insurance will cover acupuncture, it will cover yoga, it will cover meditation, it will cover all kinds of things, but never say, just pray to the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray to the Lord God because He has healed your diseases. But this is the world in which we live. But it's not the world which we have to accept that it should remain that way. Right. Too long we just say, well, the world's supposed to get more evil. It's supposed to get worse. I believe that the world is supposed to be filled with the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. I believe that the presence of God needs to be revealed to the nations through the church. And it's time for the church to stop to say, oh, the evil is coming, the evil is coming. I can't wait to get out of here. I can't wait to escape. I can't wait that there's some way I can get out of here that the Antichrist will not, not come and find me. Oh, it's time for us to say that we will stand and that we are not afraid to live fully for God in our generation. Why troop life? Because we cannot allow a generation to slip away unchallenged, untrained, and unprotected. It's useless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night, anxiously working for food to eat, for God gives rest to His loved ones. Our children have more things than ever. Don't they? Don't your children have more things than you had? Yeah. Yeah. Cell phones, iPads, computers, gaming systems, paid for activities by the score. Parents anxiously work hard to provide all that kids need. When we say that we want to give our children more than we had, none of that should be material things. Hear me clearly, none of it should be material things. Everything of it should be that they should have a solid spiritual foundation. One that sets them up so strongly that they will not waver, that they will not fall, that they will know whom they believe. And from that strong foundation, education can rise. From that strong foundation, a good work ethic can rise. From that strong foundation... Leadership can rise, but that is the foundation. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. See, children are a gift from the Lord. I love that it says in verse 3, they are re a reward from it. They are a gift and a reward. Children are a gift and a reward. Amen? Yeah. yeah. Kids are special. Kids need to be stewarded. Children need to be stewarded in the kingdom mindset. They need to be raised up so that they can be solid believers. They need to be stewarded. They not, don't just need to be protected, and they need to be expanded in the things of God. Amen. Amen? Amen? Education is very important, but education always should take at least second place to faith. Yes. They, see, children born to young men are like arrows in a warrior's hand. The Greek word for sin has its connotations and meanings to miss the target or miss the mark. But children who are trained in the things of God, yes, trained, are indeed arrows 
that will hit the bullseye. And that's our heart and that's our desire. That in every place, we want to see this happen. This training come to a child's life. And you know, the truth of the matter is that sometimes a child will listen to another adult mentor in a different way than they will listen to a parent. It just is so. And so, troop life provides a safe place. Families that have believers in them, believing families, provide a safe place to help kids grow and learn those things that they need to. But troop life will also be a great place of discipleship. That's the purpose, to disciple nations, to disciple children into nations. Doesn't mean that they won't sin or that sin will never come and, and will never be an issue or a problem at some point. But he's saying that the purpose will be made clear. If you know where you came from and you know why you are here, then you will understand how you should live. You see, a warrior who can shoot an arrow but misses the target is a dangerous warrior. But a warrior who can shoot and hit its target, that is the prize of every, every war, every army. Verse 5, how joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. He will not be put to shame when he confronts his accusers in the city gates. Now, I have and my family has heard the rebukes from many people, even well-meaning people, about the fact that we have homeschooled our children. Now, this is not a rebuke for those who don't homeschool. It's not intended to, to switch it around and say, no, you haven't done right or you're not doing right. But I'm just saying that, that our intent has always been to raise our children in with the, the right, to give them the right worldview, to give them the tools that they need to stand up and to be able to weather the storms and to deal with the attacks of the enemy that come from so many sides. But it, it's not homeschool that makes them right. It's not Christian education that makes them right. It is the Lord who builds the house. So parents, parents to be, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. So it becomes the most important, the most essential part of our lives is that we would raise our children in the things of Christ so that they may endure the questions, that they may endure the insinuations, that they may endure all the attacks and then when they are when they face by them, when, when the accusers come that we as parents will not be ashamed because they have stood up and they have weathered the storms. Because we took them to the Word. We laid a solid foundation for their lives. So unless the Lord builds the house, unless the Lord builds the house, the work of the builders is wasted. It's important for us to, the time that we have with our children, be it 18 years that they are under our roof, be it 20 years, be it 20 some years that they're under our roof with us, unless the Lord builds the house, we will labor in vain. And I believe that, that in all things, this should be our heart and our goal. And as we think about, about all that, that we do in life and all that we hope 
to, to produce the success of the next generation, the success of our children. According to God's Word, the greatest value that we can impress in them is that we point them to Christ. Not just say, well, there's Jesus, and we're simply satisfied with a, with a, a little prayer. Don't get me wrong. With a little prayer that says, forgive me, Jesus, because I have sinned. But we point them to Christ in such a way that there's not just a prayer, but there is a way in which they live and which they walk. That there is a purpose beyond just a ticket to heaven. There is a purpose that says they will stand up and they will be strong in the next generation. Daniel tells us that they who know, those who know their God, shall be strong and do exploits. That is the generation that we want to see raised up in our day. The generation that will be strong and take action not in protests, not in marches, but in their sphere of influence, they will not cower to the pressures and the ideologies of our day. May God help us that we will allow Him to build our house, our home. Let's stand as we pray. Lord, I thank you today, Lord, that as we stand before you, we think of the words of Psalm 127. Lord, we know that you are building the house, that you are building each family. Lord, as we stand here, we represent families today. And Lord, it is our desire, it is our heart, it is our hope in everything that we do. Lord, that we would have you of among all things, Lord, that you would build our house, that you would build our family, that you would build our homes, Lord, that they might be central, that, that you might be central, that you might be first, and that you might be everything that we are about. Lord, may this be the foundation of all things in our lives. And we thank you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.